You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 124, covering the week of June 4th through June 8th, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. You can follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. You can like us on Facebook at Abbeville Institute. And, of course, you can subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville I-N-S-T. If you don't want to get out and find those things, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you get all our social media buttons. Click on those. Take you right to them. You also have our Amazon Smile button. You can contribute to the Abbeville Institute while you're shopping at Amazon. So buy your favorite stuff at Amazon and also help the Abbeville Institute. You can also help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition by donating to the Abbeville Institute. You can donate as little as $3 a month if you're a student or $5 if you're not a student or annually $25 a year if you're a student or $50 a year if you're not a student. Just go to abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a little support tab. Click on that, and it'll give you an option for uh, donor levels, and you can find all of our different donor levels there. Also, you can find us at your favorite application store. You can go to uh, Google Play or iTunes, and you can find the Abbeville Institute app, which includes a link to this podcast and download it or also our lecture material, and also it's your mobile way to get to the web. So if you're not someone who likes to sit at a computer, get our mobile app. And you can also support the Institute by going to our webpage. At the top of the page, you'll see that support button as well. Under that, you'll see something that says Shop. Click on that. It'll take you out and you can get your Abbeville Institute apparel. Your hats, t-shirts, golf shirts, golf towels, a lot of cool stuff there. So it's all embroidered, very nice. It's not screen printed. It's embroidered material, so it will last forever. It's a nice way to support the Institute. And don't forget, we have our summer school coming up July 15th through 20th, 2018 at Seabrook Island, South Carolina. The topic is Southern Identity Through Music. A lot of great speakers. We've got Bobby Horton as our uh, banquet speaker. Yours truly will be there. And a whole lot of great stuff. So come on out. Space is limited. Seats are filling up very quickly. We're about a month away now, so you want to get in on that. You don't want to wait around because it will fill up. So come on out to our summer school, Southern Identity Through Music. All right. Well, let's talk about the week that was at the Institute. The theme for this week is myths. We've got a lot of them. Of course, when you talk about Southern history and you look at how people portray Southern history, oftentimes... It is full of myths. Now, they would say it's full of myths because they're talking about the lost cause myth. They're talking about Southerners rewriting their own history, and they're saying stuff that's not true. They're making stuff up. But what we see is the exact opposite, that the myths are actually perpetuated by the establishment historians, that the myths are things that most Americans believe, like, for example, the war was all about slavery, uh, Southerners are the only uh, racist, pro-slavery people in American history. They're the evil other in American society. The South has always been the problem in America, et cetera, et cetera. What we find, though, is that it's the exact opposite. I mean, the, the So what we have in this particular week, we actually have five essays dedicated to a, ver- to a specific myth. So I'm going to go through these. We'll just start with Monday, and we'll go through the five myths that are being confronted in these particular essays. So this is a fun little exercise in uh, exploring myths. So let's start with the first one. Myth. West Virginia was a Union stronghold and legally created during the war. In fact, it was legal secession and as opposed to illegal secession. So Confederate West Virginia, or I'm sorry, I should say West Virginia, was pro-Union. Confederate West Virginia never existed. Myth. So let's talk about the reality of the situation. And this piece is written by Frank Ball. So when you look at West Virginia, and Frank Ball has done a nice job with this, uh, the idea that there was somehow a Union stronghold in West Virginia, or I mean, t- take it a little bit further west than that, you've got a Union stronghold in East Tennessee, you've got Union strongholds in in uh, North Alabama, you got all these Union strongholds. And the, 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 rea- the, the myth that the establishment says is that the South was dedicated to the war. You had all these different pockets of resistance. You have the Free State of Jones in Mississippi. The reality is that 
this just simply isn't true. When you look at mobilization, the Confederacy mobilized 85% of its white population. Mobilized for war, 85% of its white population. That includes places like West Virginia, North Alabama, East Tennessee, North Mississippi. Uh, It includes those places. And when you look at the reality of West Virginia, there was a substantial amount of Confederate support in West Virginia. But what you had there was a small pocket of pro-Union men who were able to use the general government to their advantage and essentially seize several counties or seize an area and start making counties out of them. And then therefore appeal to the general government in the United States for military support. And when that happened, Lincoln said, okay, you can form a state government. Now, um, this is an odd position because if Lincoln is saying that Virginia never left the Union, then you can't create a state government there. Of course, Lincoln's position from the beginning is that these states are in rebellion. They're still states. So how can the general government tell a state that you can form a government in the state? That is 100% illegal, unconstitutional. The states are the building blocks, not the other way around. We've known that from the time that the first constitution for the United States was written, and that, of course, was the Articles of Confederation. Nothing changed with the Constitution for the United States, or the United States Constitution, nothing changed there. So Lincoln says, form a government. And then they appeal for statehood, which means that essentially a state is being created within a state, and in order to do that, it had to have the permission of Virginia, which it didn't have. Now, if Virginia is still in the Union, then it would have the, the, the legislature of Virginia would have said, okay, you can create a state out of out of Virginia. Then it would have had to go into the Congress and been approved. Now, he got that part of it. The Congress said, oh, yeah, we've got West Virginia. Of course, they're going to say that. So people will often say, well, you Southerners don't support secession, because if you did, you'd support the secession of West Virginia from Virginia. Um, big difference here, right? You can't create, it's in the Constitution. You can't create a state out of a state without the permission of the state. Whereas, when you look at Article 1, Section 10, it doesn't say a state cannot secede from the Union. There's no express prohibition on it. And every power that was not granted to the general government by the states is reserved to the states. That would include the reservation of secession or also nullification. So this is a great essay because I think Frank does a very nice job getting into the uh, issues that led to the illegal creation of West Virginia and also the myth that somehow... West Virginia was his union stronghold, and the myth that West Virginia was created legally. All of that is a myth. It's a myth. But yet, um, you're going to be told the exact opposite if you go to your university or college, or maybe even your high school history course, that uh, the people of West Virginia wanted to break away from this evil confederacy that the people of West Virginia were certainly dedicated to the Union, and Lincoln rode in on a white horse and saved the day. That's the myth you're going to be told. You're going to be told that uh, the South was inconsistent in their application of states' rights because they didn't support this secession. Ridiculous. But uh, this is why the Abbey Village Institute exists, so we can talk about stuff like this. And you know, because you listen to this podcast and you read our material and support us, you know that all of these myths are simply not true. So let's look at myth number two. It's the myth on Tuesday. Myth. Sherman's actions in the South and the actions of the Union Army in the South were generally benign. There were a few pockets, areas, where The Union Army Army got out of control, but this was not Union policy. And the South was treated well by the Union Army. In actuality, you had war crimes against Southern civilians. This is a review of the book by Walter Bryan Sisko, War Crimes Against Southern Civilians. And it does a very nice job explaining why you need to get this book. The picture that we use on the website is the image of Columbia, South Carolina, after it was burned by Sherman's troops, the supposedly benign 
and not total war. I mean, this is the this is the new uh, critique of this entire idea that the South was punished by the war. That no, 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 this wasn't really total war. Total war is something else. Total war is when civilians are the primary target, and it's actually Union policy that that's the case. That's total war. What the Union was really doing was just taking out the infrastructure of the South, making sure they couldn't keep producing weapons and munitions, making sure they couldn't have the implements of war. That's total war. What we're doing, or that's not total war. That That's just making sure that... Um, the South can't continue fighting the war. We didn't attack civilians directly. No, that never happened. In fact, there's a book that was written in the late 90s entitled The Hard Hand of War by Mark Grimsley that basically makes that point. Oh, well, this wasn't really total war. Uh, yeah, the, the South did face a hard hand of war at one point, but this was, you know, this was isolated. Southerners were treated well. In fact, General Buell of the Union Army his policy was, we're going to treat the South well, we're going to treat civilians well, and uh, overall, this, is a, this was a benign occupation. And then you have some other individuals come along. There's a book that uh, I reviewed not long ago about the Mil Union occupation of North Alabama and how that was the case. These Northerners are restrained in their treatment of Southern civilians. And, of course, Lincoln's policy was treat the Southern civilians well because we cannot have a situation where they are interested in, quote-unquote, rebellion against military rule. So the idea is that these Southerners are perpetuating a myth that the South was punished, that Southerners were uh, abused and people, people's property seized and burnt. Uh, torch, Southerners tortured. The The reality is all of that happened. And Cisco has done a very nice job chronicling this in his book, War Crimes Against Southern Civilians. If you want to look at a people in the United States that have suffered through war crimes, it is Southern civilians. Southern civilians. Uh, just take Columbia, South Carolina. We've talked about it several times in this podcast, but burned after the city surrendered by the Union Army. Now, of course, Sherman would say, we didn't do it. That was that was uh, that was Southerners burning their own city. Heck, they burned Richmond, so we didn't do it. They surrendered. We were going to be nice to them, but yet they started the fire, and then they blamed it on us. Well, the evidence is that as Sherman's troops moved through South Carolina, they burned all kinds of things just for fun, like Wade Hampton's properties. They confiscated property. They even uh, this is the thing about it. You know, they're supposedly here to liberate slaves and help out our poor downtrodden African Americans. They were going in and destroying their property too as we've seen over and over again in South Carolina. And and Columbia, of course, wasn't alone. You had the March to the Sea, where that 60-mile-wide swath of destruction it, uh, started in Atlanta and made it to Savannah. You also had the Union movements through Alabama, which is led by James Harrison Wilson, about the same time. Uh, it was a little bit later, 1865. And, of course, during Wilson's raid through Alabama, you had property confiscated and destroyed, you had people tortured. There were, I mean, there's eyewitness accounts of this stuff. Uh, even the slaves talked about it, how they were worried about their the property of the home that they were, uh, of course, living in that area being destroyed, and it was. Uh, horses, food, anything that wasn't tied down was taken by the Union Army. When the Union Army got to Columbus, Georgia, they raided the city. They broke into the bank vault and stole all the Confederate money. Even though they knew it was going to be worthless, they stole it anyway, stuffing their pockets full of Confederate money. And then they burned the city. After it had surrendered, just like good old W.T. Sherman did in Columbia, South Carolina. So this was not an isolated situation. You had the Beast, Butler in New Orleans, with his order to... Uh, make women ladies of the night, essentially, just because they supported the Confederacy. Ridiculous. But this is the idea. All of that stuff is just exaggerated by Southerners to show that the Union Army was a bunch of bad guys. They really weren't. They were just really good guys. They were just the good guys. And the good guys sometimes, as Sherman says, war is hell and you got to punish the opposition. And Southerners deserved it anyways. They seceded from the Union. They deserved it. This is what the myth is. That's the real myth. They were traitors. They had to be punished. The reality is that war crimes were committed. 
the only people on American soil to ever face war crimes on American soil were Southerners. Now, of course, we know that POWs over in Japan or in Vietnam and these other wars, Americans faced horrible situations. Those are war crimes as well. But Americans on American soil, the only Americans on American soil to ever experience war crimes came at the hand of the United States government. There was actually a, a, a essay I read a couple of years back, an op-ed, saying we should no longer call it, and, and historians are starting to do this now, we don't call it the Union and the Confederacy. We need to start calling it the United States and the Confederacy because the Confederacy were the traitorous bad guys. So we got to call it the United States because it was the United States. That If you call it the Union, you're implying that the that um, the Confederacy was somehow legitimate, and it wasn't. Or you call them the the rebels, or I mean, so what? What the idea is that the the Confederacy is fighting against the United States, and because they're fighting against the United States, these guys are bad guys. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with calling the United States because you had two separate governments. De facto, and I would say even de jure, even though some people disagree with that, de jure governments in North America. All right, so there's myth number two. Myth number three, uh, the pilgrims in New England began America and not the South. Not only that, the pilgrims were these good people, and the South were these evil people. Now, this is an essay by Dissident Mama, and it's, it completes her series of essays on Yankees, essentially, is what it does. The thing I like about this essay, she begins talking about how, you know, she was, she's converted into, uh, you know, this, she was a leftist at one point, and then had a revelation, had an epiphany that this was the wrong side. And she writes this essay almost as a self-exploratory journey into her current thought process. And, of course, you get the idea, if you study American history, you take American history in your schools, that somehow the pilgrims were here first, and they had the first Thanksgiving. The South is bad, the North is good, etc., etc., Uh, and what you get out of it, that are these false theories of equality and tolerance and these type of things. And of course, that saturates everything in education. So education soaks up these myths. And she says it even filters into the homeschool population, which she's part of, Um uh, that they don't like the fact that you would uh, perhaps be critical of Abraham Lincoln. Or it's a civil war. It's not a civil war. I mean, homeschoolers are not immune to these things. In fact, no one's really amused to it. Why? Uh, immune to it. Why? We're, we're, we're amused by it. We are, anyways. No one's really immune to it. Why? Because it's the Lincolnian myth of America. The Lincolnian myth of America is that we're one nation indivisible, centralized authority, all of that. That's the Lincolnian myth. And the South is bad, the North is good. So that Lincolnian myth has saturated everything in American society. And I think that's perhaps more important than this myth than just you know, the pilgrims are good, the South is bad. It's just that the North was good. And the South was bad from the beginning. And you go back and you look at, uh, and of course, you know, this is Hollywood, but um, everyone, if you've studied enough Western civilization, knows about the Battle of Thermopylae. Even if you have it now because of Hollywood, people, under, people know about this Battle of Thermopylae because of the sensationalized Hollywood film 300. But there's a line in that where Leonidas meets Xerxes. And of course, it's Hollywood, so never said it, but... You can see the Spartans saying something like this. And Xerxes is blasting Leonidas, saying, I'm going to erase you from history. And Leonidas says, no, people will know that tyranny 
that, that individualism essentially stood against tyranny, that few stood against many. And this is why Southerners, people like Basil Gildersleeve, believed that when the war was over, people would look at the Southern soldier and say, yes, that is the true expression of Western civilization, that the North would be viewed as the bad guys and the South as the good guys, these heroic men standing up for self-determination, for independence, against tyranny. This is what Gildersleeve actually believed, that Southerners would be viewed in that light for generations to come, that Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and the common Southern soldier, that these men, Jefferson Davis, who was in fact cheered by the North when he's being released from prison, that this was going to be their perpetual view of the war, that Lincoln would be seen as the bad guy, that he would be the Xerxes. But somehow today that myth, the myth that Lincoln is somehow the good guy, has been perpetuated, whereas Southerners, in the reality, have become the bad guys. And so you've got this Lincolnian myth, Lincoln's a good guy, the centralization is good, the North is always good, the South is always bad. And that bridges into the myth of the lost cause, which of course was discussed on Thursday by Bo Trawick. He calls it the law of, called it the lost cause, but there's the myth of the lost cause. And he begins with a quote by Voltaire, who said that history is the propaganda of the victorious. And he starts with what is often defined as the quote-unquote lost cause myth. Quote, Former Confederates crafted a historical interpretation of the Civil War to reconcile the pre-war society they admired and the devastation that accompanied Southern defeat. The lost cause narrative was developed by former Confederates who claimed that states' rights, not slavery, caused the war, that enslaved blacks remained faithful to their masters, and that the South was defeated only by overwhelming numerical and industrial strength. Confederate Veteran Memorial Association promoted lost cause themes to help white Southerners cope with the many changes during this era. Blah, blah, blah. So you have this supposedly, according to this Virginia Historical Society, this lost cause myth. And none of this is true. First, states' rights, not slavery, that's not true. Blacks remain faithful, that's not true. The South is only defeated by overwhelming American industrial strength. That's not true. All that's a myth. All that people, Southerners made this stuff up. In other words, Southerners are not just evil people. They're liars. And so Bo Trawick takes it all apart, and he exposes what the real myth is, and that's the righteous cause myth. Now, he doesn't call it that, but that's what it is. It's the righteous cause myth, that somehow the North was raging a righteous cause and that the South was really fighting for slavery, and so the North is trying to eradicate slavery, that that black Southerners really didn't support the war, that they didn't remain faithful during the war. Somehow, they, there's all these slave insurrections taking place, which never happened, and all these other things. So this is the myth. This is the myth. The righteous cause myth, that the North was somehow fighting to free slaves. We know that's not true. Lincoln said as much from the very first day he was inaugurated as president. He said, look, all I want to do is save the Union. And when the war began, I'm fighting to save the Union. And that was the case all the way up until 1865. <laughs> he never really changed course. You had the Emancipation Proclamation, but he never said that ending slavery was a goal of the war. You had the Gettysburg Address, which actually uh, is part of the myth on Friday. You had the Gettysburg Address which somehow made this righteous cause out of this, that uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth, even though he's fighting against the people who were creating a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So you have that. But this is the issue. This is what we have. You have these myths. You have this righteous cause mythology that's actually incorrect. The lost cause, quote-unquote, myth is closer to reality than anything the North propagated after the war. That's why it's called Northern Propaganda. And uh, when you look at Lincoln's position, I said he was fighting you know, for the Union till the end. At the Hampton Roads Conference, he was willing to put off slavery for five years and pay Southerners as up to $400 million to compensate them for their slaves. That's, I, I guess Lincoln was fighting against slavery. 
yeah, uh, at least for five more years. Uh, yeah, just come on back in. We'll let it go. We'll, we'll, we'll just put this off for a while. So slavery would have ended, but we, they would have done it in a different way. So the myth is that somehow Lincoln was an immediate abolitionist, that the South was just fighting for slavery and the North against slavery, that states' rights had nothing to do with this, that uh, the South was... Was uh, the South was defeated over by overwhelming odds? They were defeated by overwhelming odds. This is what Lee said. I mean, show me an example where that wasn't the case. <laughs> That's somehow a myth. This is just ridiculous. But this is what you get now. I mean, the South, uh, uh, the North didn't have overwhelming odds. These two sections were equal. <laughs> it, it's it's so preposterous. You almost don't even know why you have to respond to these things. But this is what happens because the establishment has come with this type of narrative. And so you have to be fighting back against that at all times, it seems like. I mean, this is, as, as Clyde Wilson has said, I could, I could respond to these things every single day of the week, 365 days of the year, for a 30-year career or longer. You could do it because there are so many of them and so few of us. And so the establishment is controlling the narrative, and the narrative is wrong. You have, uh, as, as Don Livingston said the other day to me, you have people like James McPherson taking off his professor robes and going around stumping for removing Confederate monuments. McPherson, a guy who knows better, he's done research, he's actually written books that are pretty good. The most important for calls and comrades, where he knew better, he knew what Southerners were fighting for. He knows better, yet he's going to go out and stump to take these things down anyways, because he can, because he's of the establishment. If you're not doing this, well, then you're not really one of us. It's all about groupthink, groupthink, and it's worst form. They say that we're guilty of groupthink and and believing in myths, you know, like Santa Claus, or uh, we're believing in myths like, uh, uh, you know, take your pick of your myth. Most of these people would say the myth of Christianity or whatever it is. They, they would say we're believing in myths, things that don't exist. It's fairy tales, fairies and uh, pixies and what else. We're believing those things. It's just uh, uh, it's a religion almost. It's not true. Southerners were critical of themselves. Even the, uh, those who were sup- supposedly propagating this myth of the lost cause understood the, they, were cri- they were critical of the South. But they were clear in their self-determination. And so last piece we have for the week is the myth of incorporation of the First Amendment. This is written by Joe Wolverton. It's another myth. And uh, this is an important myth because uh, and you, you would get into to politics here. But the important thing about it, when you look at the 14th Amendment, it's the myth of the 14th Amendment somehow incorporated the Bill of Rights against the state constitutions. And this actually has to do with Lincoln's perception of America, that we're one nation. And so the 14th Amendment supposedly came in and said, okay, the first state amendments apply to the states, even though at the time, no one who wrote the amendment, or I could say no one, there was maybe a, one or two people, who were interested in incorporation, but the Supreme Court actually knocked that down, that whole idea down, from a Lincoln-appointed Supreme Court. They said, that's not true. The, the, the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to the states. Everyone knows this. John Marshall said this. And in fact, what's really interesting during that debate on the 14th Amendment in the Congress, there were some people that stood up and the Republicans and said, well, the Bill of Rights already applies to the states because just look at the language of the Constitution. It says in here that uh, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which means that the Bill of Rights already applies. It's part of the Constitution, so it applies to the states. we got the Supremacy Clause saying so. And you had other Northerners stand up and say, Are you stupid? Did you not read Baron v. Baltimore? Did you not know this is not the case? We've known this for now uh, 80 years that the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to the states. We've known that. What, you're making this up now. You're making a myth. And so then the Supreme Court, of course, knocks down the idea that the 14th Amendment applied to the states. Uh, and uh, that, was the, that was not the intent of the 14th Amendment. And then you get the 20th century Supreme Court, which creates a myth, the myth of incorporation. This is another myth. 
And so you have all these myths in America. And why does this matter? Because you have the ability for the general government to centralize power through incorporation. Everything becomes a federal issue. The states become impotent. They can't do anything. They're emasculated. The states become mere corporate identities. They are not the building blocks of union. They are created by the central authority. This is what James Wilson was saying all the way back in 1785. Of course, everybody knew that was wrong back then. But yet somehow that myth of American history, the nationalist myth, has been foisted on us. The Lincolnian myth. So all of these pieces we had this week go back to really that singular myth in America, that we had an American nation of one people and that the central power was supreme from the beginning. The states were just afterthoughts. Well, of course they ratified the Constitution of the states. Where else would they do it? This is John Marshall. We've had that myth, and of course that myth is entirely that, a myth. The nationalist myth of America. The righteous cause myth. All of these myths, those are the real myths of America. We're talking about the truth of American history at the Abbeville Institute, which, as I've said before in this podcast, the South is America. It always has been. The Southern position has always been the American position, but somehow these myths have overtaken Americans, and we've got these incorrect assumptions now floating around out there in the uh, air. You know, it's just kind of you breathe it in, and you think it... Um, in, in American history. We've got uh, Lincoln and the, and the American Parthenon. He's the city god of Washington, uh, just like Athena was in the, uh, the temple there at, uh, of, of Athena at Greece. We've got that in Washington, but it's Lincoln sitting there and not Athena. It's, she's, he's worshipped like you would a deity, like you would a pagan god. He's the god of the state. And so that's what we're left with in American history. Until next time, good day. Thank you.